Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's December 16th. Today, we celebrate a botanist remembered for his work with pears and camellias. We'll also learn about a botanist who specialized in grasses and traveled extensively to collect them. We'll learn about the work of a forensic botanist back in the early 1980s, and we'll take a moment to savor December, courtesy of a verse from the American naturalist and writer Hal Borland one of my favorites. And we grow that garden library today with a book that came out this summer, and it brings the goodness of the Catskills right to your table. And then we'll wrap things up with the cute little story about a plant name you won't soon forget. But first, I just want to take a second to tell you about the Daily Gardener Friday newsletter. Each and every Friday, even when the show is on break, subscribers to the newsletter get an exclusive email from me with some super useful content. It includes helpful reminders and tips for the week to help you grow as a gardener. I also include a handy list of the featured books for the week from the Grow That Garden Library segment of the podcast. It's so handy. You'll get a brand new botanist profile and a few hand-picked pieces of botanical poetry that have never been shared on the show. And you'll also receive plenty of trending garden-inspired recipes, gifts, and hacks. And finally, I like to make the newsletter a little more personal, so you'll see photos and stories about my own home and garden, in addition to exclusive updates about the show. It's a little behind-the-scenes VIP experience for super fans of the podcast. And finally, don't forget that each week, one lucky subscriber will be chosen as a winner for a lovely gardening book from the Grow That Garden Library bookshelf. And if you enjoy the podcast, you're going to love the newsletter. So head on over to thedailygardener.org and sign up for the free Friday newsletter today. Here's today's curated garden news. This article came to my attention courtesy of Mary Beth Hughes, and she found a good one. This one was featured in Atlas Obscura, and it was written by Dan Nasowitz. And I think you'll agree that the title of it is very intriguing. It asks, how did Madagascar become the world's biggest producer of vanilla? And just to add a little more intrigue, I should tell you that the subtitle is A Tale of Botanical Mystery, Colonialism, and Savvy Marketing. In any case, Mary Beth, I loved this article, and I thank you so much for sharing it with me and with the listeners of the show. So if you'd like to check out this article on Madagascar, All you need to do is head on over to the listener community for the show in the free Facebook group called the Daily Gardener Community. It's where I share all of my curated news articles and original blog posts. So you never have to take any notes or search for links. The next time you're on Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community where you'd search for a friend and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the anniversary of the death of the Massachusetts merchant, amateur horticulturist, and politician, Marshall Pinckney Wilder, who died on this day, December 16th in 1886. When Marshall started out, his father gave him three options, attend college, start a farm, or work in the family store. Marshall elected to farm. But Marshall was unexpectedly pulled into the family business after his uncle died. In a twist of fate, Marshall was a natural businessman, and he helped take the family wholesale business to even more successful heights. 
With his financial success, Marshall bought an old farm in Dorchester, Massachusetts for $5,500. Marshall called the property Hawthorne Grove. But shortly after moving into Hawthorne Grove, Marshall's young wife, Eliza, died. With four small children to raise, Marshall quickly married again. And after his personal affairs were squared away, Marshall began designing 10 acres worth of gardens on the property, complete with several large greenhouses. Marshall devoted all of his spare time to horticulture, and he loved to dabble in plant breeding. Historical records indicate that Marshall developed a double California poppy. But without a doubt, Marshall's favorite pursuits were pears and camellias. Marshall successfully cultivated two European pears, the Bartlett and the Anjou. In pears alone, Marshall experimented with over 900 varieties. And Marshall's camellia collection made him quite famous in certain botanical circles. In all, Marshall Wilder created over 300 camellia varieties. And Marshall's top award-winning camellias were all named after the women in his life. Mrs. Abby Wilder, named for his second wife. Mrs. Julia Wilder, named for his third wife, who was also Abby's sister. And Jenny Wilder, named for his granddaughter. In 1839, a greenhouse fire destroyed all but two of Marshall's beloved camellias. Still, Marshall bounced back quickly the following year, thanks to his success in the wholesale business. When Marshall wasn't gardening at Hawthorne Grove, he was active in horticultural organizations in and around Boston. In addition to serving as the third president of the Massachusetts Horticultural Society, Marshall was the founder and first president of the American Pomological Society. And on Google right now, it says the American Pomological Society was founded by Marshall Pinckney Wilder in 1848 to foster the growing of fruit and the development of new varieties and is the oldest fruit organization in North America. When the great landscape architect Andrew Jackson Downing suddenly died, it was Marshall Wilder who delivered his eulogy before the Pomological Congress in Philadelphia in 1852. And since 1873, the Pomological Society awards the Wilder Medal to pomologists who demonstrate outstanding service to horticulture in the broad area of pomology. During his lifetime, Marshall became quite famous for his horticultural activities, and after his death, Marshall's private plant collection was used to create the Boston Public Garden. And here's a fun fact about Marshall Pinckney Wilder. He had a nephew who became a well-known American author and speaker with dwarfism, and he shared the same name as his uncle, Marshall Pinckney Wilder. And it was Marshall's nephew named Marshall who inspired the phrase, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. That phrase was written by Albert Hubbard, who was inspired by the younger Marshall's passion, optimism, and innovation. And today is the anniversary of the death of the botanist and agristologist Albert Speer Hitchcock, who died on this day, December 16th in 1935. 
During a trip to Ecuador, Albert took a marvelous photo of an Espelidia with the common name Frelejones, or big monks. These large plants are in the sunflower family, and they're reminiscent of a mullen with their hairy leaves. But these plants are succulents, and at high altitudes, they can capture water vapor from passing clouds. Peter Rockstro wrote about Aspletia in a blog post a few years ago. He wrote, Of all the botanical oddities to be found in Colombia, frailejones are probably one of the most striking. Frailejones are members of the cosmopolitan sunflower family, giant daisies in the genus Aspletia. They are the tallest plants in the family, with some reaching nearly 60 feet. When not in bloom, few people would even recognize them as members of this family. They can look quite spooky, as some populations retain their dead foliage folded over the stem, forming a thick coat to avoid water from freezing in the xylem. When these plants are standing in the mist, it's easy to understand how they could be mistaken for friars wearing thick brown robes. Hence the name Frelejon in Spanish, a big friar. Now, although the big friar or the big monk plant easily captures our attention, Albert Hitchcock's name is synonymous with grasses. In the back half of his career, Albert joined the USDA, and from that point forward, his professional career was devoted to grasses. Albert helped to establish the nearly completely comprehensive grass collection at the National Herbarium in Washington. Albert's book called The Manual of Grasses remains a primary reference for the subject, and in addition to his masterpiece on grasses, Albert wrote over 250 botanical works during his lifetime. A staunch conservationist, Albert was alarmed at the rapid rate of destruction of the world's tropical forests and jungles. Albert was also a tremendous mentor and colleague. And sadly, Albert suffered a heart attack while he was on his way home from a major botanical conference in Amsterdam. He died on board the ship City of Norfolk. After Albert's death, the botanist Agnes Chase prepared his eulogy, and she recounted how Albert once walked nearly 250 miles over a three-week-long botanizing trip. And she recalled this excerpt from Albert. I waded through water almost up to my knees, pushed my wheelbarrow, and still managed to keep my collection dry. The mosquitoes were very bad. I had to wear my coat, put cheesecloth around my head, and a pair of extra socks on my hands. My shoes had worn through, and my feet were blistered. But for all the discomforts, the collecting was magnificent, and I felt fully repaid. And in a fitting final gesture, Albert Hitchcock's massive private herbarium and library were donated to the Smithsonian. And it was on this day, December 16th in 1982, that the news press out of Fort Myers, Florida, shared a story called Botanist Determines If the Gardener Did It by Walter Putnam. Here's an excerpt. When police investigators are stumped by a thorny problem, they sometimes call in University of Florida scientist David Hall to help them nip a case in the bud. If the gardener did it, Hall is the one to help prove it. He could be considered a Quincy of the plant world. Unlike the television hero, and real-life medical examiners who collect criminal evidence through autopsies, Hall gathers his from stems and twigs. David said, 
I first got into forensic botany when Dr. Dan Ward and I were asked to help out on a South Florida murder case. A guy was suspected of strangling a woman. He told police that she invited him in, but they found bits of bark on the windowsill and in his pants cuffs. And we matched that bark to the bark on the tree outside her window. He'd climbed in the window and attacked her. Hull's specialty is plant taxonomy, or identifying plants. He said, when you deal with the names of plants, you have to know a whole lot of other things about them. The ecology, their physiology, the morphology, or shape of plants. Hall recalled one suit in which the family of a train accident victim claimed that the crossing sign had been down long before the collision. The railroad maintained that the victim's car had knocked it over. But a type of fungus growing on the signpost proved it had been on the ground long before the accident. Hall said, I've never been called to testify. Not in a single case. They've all been settled out of court. In unearthed words, today's words are from the American naturalist and writer Hal Borland from his book called The Golden Circle from the chapter called December. December is a blizzard in Wyoming and a gale on the lakes and the Berkshires frosted like a plate of cupcakes. It is bare trees and evergreens. It is rustling weed stems and a gleam of partridge berry on the hillside, a cluster of checkerberries and winter greens in the thin woodland. It is ground pine, older than the hills where it grows, and it is a seedling maple from two years ago clinging to one last scarlet leaf. It is a stiff-tailed young squirrel scrambling up an oak tree. And it is a mask-faced coon in the cornfield, listening for the hounds. It is ice on the pond, lichen on the rock, and a flock of chickadees at the dooryard feeder. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Catskills Farm to Table Cookbook by Courtney Wade. This book came out in 2020, and the subtitle is Over 75 Recipes. In this book, Courtney takes us to the Catskills, where she shows us that the food there is centered around fresh vegetables and fruit, meat, dairy, wild game, and foraged produce. A chef, photographer, and graphic designer, Courtney lives on a farm in the Catskills in upstate New York. Her lovely cookbook is the perfect showcase for all of Courtney's strengths. Courtney's book is divided into seasons, and she shares recipes from favorite local hangouts. Along with excellent harvesting and growing advice, Courtney's recipes bring the goodness of the Catskills right to your table. This book is 240 pages of delicious recipes and inspiring photography that will transport you to upstate New York. You can get a copy of the Catskills Farm to Table Cookbook by Courtney Wade and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $5. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, December 16th in 1916, that an adorable little story was shared in the Star Phoenix out of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Here's what it said. A famous botanist was pacing slowly along a country road, his eyes, as usual, roaming from side to side for new plants to study. Suddenly, an eager look swept across his features, 
and he leaned over a low fence enclosing a cottage garden. He had found a plant he did not know. What could it be? If only he had a specimen of it to study. At that moment, a shock-headed lad strolled along the road and stopped to gaze open-mouthed at the botanist. I say, called the botanist urgently, see that there pale pink one in the corner? Do you know it? I, said the country boy briefly. What's its name, cried the botanist. Do you know what family it belongs to? The lad jerked his grubby thumb over his shoulder and pointed toward the little cottage. The Higginses. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota, with the help of Paige Mance, Brooke Beerbaum, Kiana Rayleigh, Maddie Doyle, Natalie Decker, and Eric Begay. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. You can follow the show on Instagram, and listeners always have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. All the stories and books that are featured on the show can be found over at thedailygardener.org, thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. Last but not least, you can share your own gardener greetings on the show by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.